Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, sixth and final webinar of the midterm webinar series of the Lucia project. The project Lucia Lighting the Baltic Sea region, co-founded by the European program Interreg Baltic Sea region, helps municipalities to unlock the potential of energy efficient urban lighting solutions. It provides decision makers and experts with lighting knowledge. I'm sure that many of you attended the previous webinars. We gathered great speakers from different countries and horizons, presented the different pilot sites of the Lucia project, and which put the spotlight on very different urban lighting aspects, such as social acceptance, citizen expectation toward urban lighting, urban design, or more technical subjects, such as green procurement and smart technical solutions. Today, together, we will now point the spotlight at the future. The future of urban lighting, the future of cities. What will be the major evolution of public spaces in the coming years? How is the evolution of personal mobility, with, for instance, the drop of car traffic and the lower need of functional lighting will affect urban lighting policies? What will be the new technologies of the future and how will they influence the public space? How LED, smart lighting, smart street lighting, or even bioluminescent technologies will help future-proof our cities. I must say that city of today is not the one foreseen 10 years ago, as the world is encountering a major disruption with the COVID and the inherent lockdowns and curfews going on. This sanitary crisis has revealed the need for city to adapt and to continue in a sustainable way. So with us today, we have five great speakers from Sweden, France, Netherlands, and Germany we will look at the challenge and question that transcend urban lighting today that help us build solution and answer for tomorrow. Please do ask them, ask them a lot of questions in the chat box and I will sum up them at the end of presentation. So I'm very pleased to begin with, um, to introduce Mr. Tony Ursulik, who is the chairman of Traffic Committee, City of Gothenburg, Sweden, who will take the floor for opening remarks. Thank you for being here today with us, and please take the floor, Tony. Thank you. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tony Orslich, I'm an, an, and I am the chairman of the Transport Committee, also known as the Mayor of Transport in, Goth in the city of Gothenburg. Next year, 2021, the city of Gothenburg will be celebrating its 400 year anniversary. Big plans were being made, and preparation all over the city was in full swing. The city was really looking forward to an event, a year of celebration, the founding of our great city. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are now forced to postpone the celebration until 2023. But uh, postponing celebration can be seen as keeping with tradition because uh, my predecessors in the city of Gothenburg in 1921, when the city was supposed to celebrate the 300-year anniversary, were also forced to postpone the anniversary with two years to 1923. So you can see postponing as keeping with tradition. However, we can never postpone the constant work of maintaining and develop the city. As chairman of the Transport Committee, it is my task to see that all employees of the Urban Transport Administration has good conditions so they are able to perform the task according to our vision to offer our inhabitants and visitors a sustainable city where they want to live, work, stay and meet. One of the tools to make this happen is, of course, city lighting. For nearly 20 years, the Urban Transport Administration had worked hard to develop the city lighting system into a tool to fulfill the vision of a safe and secure city, but also an inviting and welcoming city. The city has a lighting strategy, city lighting, policy of city lighting in the city of Gothenburg. The overall ob objective of this strategy is to create beautiful, safe, accessible urban spaces, clarifying the city's form and function, strengthening the city's character and attractiveness, and of course, the long-term sustainability lighting solutions. Through our international cooperation, for instance, the membership in, Luc in the Lucy Association, which we have been involved in since 2002, 
we have gained ideas, inspiration, technical knowledge that has developed our way of thinking when it comes to lighting. We have seen benefits, uh, many benefits in international collaborations, and we also hope to share our newfound knowledge with our partners throughout the world. We are convinced that together is much better than alone. Working together, we all benefit from the experience of each other's different way of solving problems and obstacles, and also celebrating our successes. The Lucia project has so far gathered very interesting and valuable information and arguments to why we must continue our pursuit of smarter, eco-friendly and more cost-efficient way to illuminate our cities. This project has the potential to show us the key to a future where we can help each other to find smarter solution, more flexible way to collaborate in the creation of livable, safe, pleasant urban spaces. It can inspire and urge us politicians, our colleagues around different countries to make decisions for more energy effective street lighting, pursue the, an eco-friendly way and for the good of all the inhabitants of the cities. This, I believe, is an important tool to reach the core message of the city of Gothenburg, a sustainable city open to the world. The future of urban lighting is now. And with those words, once again, welcome. And we are really looking forward for the rest of the Lucia project and what we will bring in terms of new knowledge and innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony Selik for being here today and for giving us uh, these opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. And now I would like to um, let the floor to Mark Buttonpage, who is the general director of the Lucy Association. Tony Ursulik just uh, uh, said a few words about the Lucy Association, which is the international network of urban lighting, of cities urban lighting. Marks. So can you, Hear me? Can you see? Yes, we can see your presentation and we can hear you. Thank okay. you. Okay, it's good to have those technical checks before. Um, so, welcome to everyone. It's uh, really great to see a lot of people uh, in this uh, in this webinar. Uh, the title was a bit daunting, you know, the future of uh, urban lighting. It's what we think about every day, and uh, the title of this presentation is, um, yeah, part of perhaps the answer. So, lighting the resilient city. So, as was uh, introduced, thank you um, to Kemi also, and uh, Mark Burton Page, I'm the general director of uh, Lucy. And okay, so this uh, on the left, you can probably recognize those from uh, Germany is Hamburg. On the right, you have Rome with empty streets. At this time, everywhere in the world, uh, cities are facing exceptional challenges. Um, they face long-term issues, of course, densification of uh, urban centers, uh, the need uh, to permanently adapt to new technologies, uh, build a smart city. Also, of course, to build uh, sustainable carbon neutral policies and um, yeah, to fight climate change issues. Today, they also face this unprecedented health crisis with the, the COVID pandemic. And again, you see empty streets. That's Lyon, Lyon again, Lyon again, and that's New York. Cities are challenged as places of socialization, uh, places where people exchange um, with others by this crisis. We're missing the free air of the city. We're missing the air that makes us free. We're missing Stadtluft macht frei uh, ideas. And with this distanciation, the curfews, the lockdowns, um, many cities resembled as ghost towns, really. And that's particularly true during the night. Here, um, of course, you have Paris, you have Bangkok. There's also a major economic crisis going on. Many companies are badly hit. And of course, the nighttime economy and the tourism sector, particularly. Uh, this will have an impact on the city economies on the long term, uh, budgets and investments. So the, the, the question is, how do we recuperate? As the COVID-19 spreads, everything we knew has been kind of turned upside down. Uh, the city has been shaken in some of its really core functions, how we move, how we work, 
how we play, how we learn, how we create in the city has been affected. So is there light at the end of the tunnel? Well, cities are vulnerable, but at the same time, they are also places with incredible resources to answer multiple layer crisis. While uh, there are many things that are unknown and uncertain, um, yeah, one thing is kind of for sure. Uh, we need to face this together. Last June, we brought together um, over 20 city members uh, from Lucy. Um, we gathered people. Of course, what did they tell us to, to really see the experiences regarding lighting and the, the COVID pandemic? What did they tell us? So, well, urban lighting is um, the, one of the only public services which stays open every night of the day, every night, every day of the year. Um, fortunately, this has really stayed true during uh, the crisis. Maintenance teams have continued their work. Uh, some cities have accelerated even uh, work to install new lighting, taking advantage, for example, of less car traffic for easier road closures, for example. One of the other things is that COVID-19 demonstrates the importance of the accessibility of urban parks after dark and uh, green spaces. Indeed, during the lockdown periods, parks were really seen as essential uh, for active mobility, social interaction, and more and more people actually use those spaces in the city, um, which are not always accessible after dark. So yeah, there's a growing need for more and more better lighting of these outdoor spaces, of course, we need to light them responsibly, um, protecting the wildlife, taking into account this human and nature uh, balance. Um, this is also a really important message for the coming years. Of course, then there's been a major disruption on how we move around the city. In many cities, congestion plans have been changed, adapted due to the adapted working hours that we all have. Um, in most cities, there's been a certain bicycle use. Um, and in some places, you know, there were pop up the bike lanes and because uh, uh, there were so many cyclists. Um, so a question that's raised is really how do we upgrade this uh, walking and bicycling infrastructure in the city? Um, and especially whether public lighting can be adaptable enough because of course it was everything, well, the public lighting for many years has been planned for cars mainly. So is it adaptable enough to respond to this uh, situation? Another layer of impacts, well, concerning live festivals, as many other outdoor and unfortunately a lot of cultural events, live festivals have been canceled, postponed, transformed, uh, changed into online formats, etc. So this is a really serious consequence for an entire industry also. Uh, and of course, how we really experience <clears throat> how we get emotionally involved in a city um, by light art in the open spaces is, uh, is, is a question for the future. How do we create those yeah, magical moments for, for crowds uh, in, in cities? So all those impacts are kind of short-term um, answers and, and questions from the crisis. Uh, but in Lucy, our mission and our, our thoughts needs to go beyond that and need to go to the, to the long term uh, with uh, uh, lessons learned or policy inspirations, perhaps. And I have four, uh, three points, perhaps three plus one uh, here that, that I want to, to share with you. Um, the first, uh, first of those uh, points is that I think there's a need to reimagine our cities after dark. And... Um, I say after dark because I think night uh, encompasses, of course, uh, all, all, the, all the, the half of our day, which is by night. Uh, it includes the small hours uh, of dusk and dawn. Night is a fantastic opportunity, actually, in many cities uh, that have mostly been considered by day. And the overall strategy is, is mostly con conceived by day in a lot of cities. Um, and I think uh, the after dark city needs to be better designed. When curfews and lockdowns are over, I really hope that we can go back to the night that we love. Um, you know, when we have time to explore, to learn, to connect, to uh, imagine differently. With light, I think we can work um, on better wayfinding, better identity, 
access to culture, to art. We can imagine places where people want to play, feel safe, comfortable. Um, through the dark moments of the year, and of course, in many countries of the Baltic Sea region, this is particularly true. Um, with better lighting, I hope, and I think we can encourage serendipity, which is kind of the unforeseen positive encounters in a city. And this is a core function of a city. This does not mean more light or more uniformity of spaces, but perhaps more better designed places, better designed um, places for, for people at night. The second point is about smart lighting and um, yeah, the appropriate use, I would say, of smart lighting um, with societal added value. I'm not talking here about technology for technology's sake. You know, I think uh, we need to focus on what makes us human after all. Technology is really a tool to improve our quality of life. And especially if we concentrate on smart lighting and um, especially dimming techniques, which are really important today, with those new approaches to lighting, cities can adapt uh, public lighting to where it's, when and where it's needed. We're seeing this becoming a reality in, in a lot of cities, um, in more and more cities, more and more lighting points. And of course, it's a fantastic thing, not only for energy consumption, but also to tackle some of the other issues like light pollution. Um, in itself, these dimming techniques constitute a real game changer, a real paradigm shift for the whole lighting urban, urban lighting field. However, it's still a work in progress. In order to do that, uh, we need to work more and especially on how best to deal with the data. Uh, the data collection from the appropriate sensors and uh, from, the, from, the, from the systems in themselves, but not only on, on collecting data, but also analyzing data and using it to make real progress at scale in the cities, not only a few thousand lighting points, but perhaps a few tens of thousands or even 100,000 lighting points. Uh, for example, a very recent example uh, that came out recently is uh, in, in the city of Tucson, Arizona, uh, which is a city where dimming is uh, uh, used widely. Um, and the study showed that light pollution um, measured in uh, nighttime satellite images uh, comes uh, especially from other sources than uh, public lighting. More than 80% of what was considered light pollution comes from other sources than public lighting. Um, and by the way, there was other uh, uh, things from this study uh, showed that when the public lighting is dimmed, even because they did a study for like one week, uh, and when public lighting is dimmed, even 30% of, of what's, uh, what's usually there, um, there were no complaints from the public. Nobody even noticed. Um, and there was also no rise in the crime statistics. Okay, it's just one study, but still, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd share it. Um, interesting things are, are starting. Perhaps we'll also learn a lot more from Rian, uh, the next speaker, uh, also from the Smart Space Project, where uh, uh, Northwest Europe, uh, a lot of things are, 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 are moving. Um, and we're also, also doing a collective work on how to develop a white paper, so recommendations and uh, ideas for cities in uh, the coming, coming months, and that's for the future, I guess. The third layer of what I wanted to talk about right now is about the fact that within those crises, resilience comes from the community. I'd like to hear insist, during a crisis, we've seen the value of our neighborhoods. With the idea of the 15 minute city that's really nicely depicted here in this, uh, this slide, small areas around where we live, we work, where we find our food, where we get access to healthcare, a lot more different things. These blocks, these neighborhoods with their distinct ambiences, well, places that are familiar to us, actually, you know, we could call them our pocket nightscapes. And these places should also be included in overall lighting strategies. In fact, quality lighting needs to be accessible to all um, and not only concentrate on the city centers where actually tourists used to be, uh, but Good lighting can be accessible to all in, in, in many, you know, different neighborhoods, not only city centers. Another thing I think this crisis has shown us that uh, it's a good time to involve people in, with new ways of participation 
um, to empower them, perhaps to innovate socially, economically, culturally. And here, smart tools can also help. We live in a time when people um, have more computing power in their pockets than when uh, NASA put men on the moon. So yeah, with this boom in online events, teleworking, um, also online gathering, etc., I think there's an opportunity. But however, we, what we see very clearly is that we need strong pre-existing communities. Ah, so let's work together more regularly uh, at various locals of, uh, of governments, various levels of government. Here is where I want to very quickly uh, have a fourth point um, about urban lighting and health. It is very new. Um, I don't even have a slide for this. So, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's coming in the immediate future. We're very happy to have a, a new Horizon 2020 project that was selected for funding. It's called Enlighten Me. And um, I think it's, it's also really important for the future. There will be 20 partners, including Lucy. It will start in, in the coming months and years. Um, there will be three pilot cities, Estonia, Netherlands, Italy, and, uh, and those countries. And the project will collect the existing data um, and good practice on urban lighting, uh, focusing on, on uh, health and well-being. So the study, the study will correlate data uh, on this you know, urban lighting, but also uh, health and socioeconomic factors. So I think it will be really interesting. There will be three living labs in those three cities and um, where a smart outdoor lighting system will be installed. And uh, yeah, so especially there will be studies on the impact on the uh, circadian rhythm. And this will take place even outdoors, which is kind of new for this study. Um, there will be studies of the impact on the overall quality of life and, uh, and well-being of, of, of this. So it's, it's I think, uh, very interesting. The project will develop guidelines and recommendations also for cities on the healthy urban lighting. So it's a it's big topic for us in the future. OK, um, perhaps uh, the last part of my presentation before we can have uh, questions. Um, what can you do? And what can you do now? What can you do today? For organizations like uh, Lucy, it's also a time to innovate uh, as we develop these online events and uh, knowledge sharing tools. And like cities, we take advantage of this, uh, our pre-existing communities and the fantastic community, actually that's been built over the years in, in Lucy. We're, we're really seeing the spirit of uh, exchange and uh, comradeship. And basically what we do in Lucy, we look, we try to connect cities to make sure they don't reinvent the wheel all the time. And um, so perhaps, yeah, if you're a member of uh, the Baltic Sea region, if you're a member of Lucy, sorry, or, or part of this Baltic Sea region here, uh, you have a, on the slide, uh, concretely, what can you do? Well. We'd like to invite you here to exchange knowledge and share your ideas uh, with the Lucia Knowledge Center, which has been created as part of this project. Uh, it's, uh, it's part of the Lucy Hub, which is a wider um, uh, platform, but uh, here it's uh, the very own uh, online platform for uh, people connecting in the, the Baltic Sea region. Right now in there, you have access to um, over 500 curated uh, knowledge blocks and, and on urban lighting. So a lot of case studies, uh, presentations, publications, um, articles. Um, yeah. So a lot of the fantastic Lucia uh, deliverables will also be on there. So the, the, the things that, that we come to, to know in this project, of course, the fact sheets, the compendiums. But what's more, you have also access to this community, the people actually of the project where we share, we work together. So it's a resource center, but it's also a collaborative tool and a space. So please come test it for yourself. And uh, you can ask for a seat at the table. As I said, if you're a Lucy member or if you have, uh, you're from this uh, region. So uh, can you just put the, in the chat here um, where you can request a seat. Um, you can find the application form here on the, on the on the project website. Of course, i um, be happy if you can contact me or my uh, colleague directly. Uh, we'd be really happy to start a conversation. There's a lot happening. It's a fantastic time to, to collaborate. Uh, there's a lot happening in Lucy. Uh, 
and uh, yeah, in the urban lighting field in general. So thank you so much uh, for your attention. And I know there's uh, some questions here, so perhaps we can address some of them. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mark, for this uh, inspiring presentation on the resident cities and uh, the need for cooperation between cities. So we do have some questions and remarks, most of them from Heike. Thank you. Uh, first remark from Heike is uh, about active mobility. Um, she said, very good point to mention how to upgrade our infrastructure for active mobility. Uh, in terms of flight, it's not on the agenda yet. Hmm. Um, do you have remarks about that? Do you have, a, I don't know, insight on uh, evolution of lighting infrastructure regarding mobility? Mark? Hello? I think we've just lost Mark. Nicola, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Camille. Uh, okay. I think, Mark, you're uh, freeze now. So please just refresh your browser window to uh, be back with us in the room. OK, we wait. Oh, here we go. Yes. OK, Mark, we can hear you again. OK, so I was, I was lagging. OK. You were in a freeze mode. Uh, could you just disable your shared screen, please? Go. And so I don't know if you were answering the question, but we didn't, you, you were frozen, so we didn't get a word. Okay, so no, I, I thought it was just a comment from, uh, from Heike um, yes. on, the, on the new upgrading, uh, the, the walking and cycling infrastructure. Uh, I think it's a question, so we should, uh, we should concentrate on this. Um, yeah, there, there, there are a few things already happening under the, the light, but uh, light, lighting infrastructure is also a long-term uh, infrastructure, so uh, we, there are some adaptations that can be done quite quickly, uh, the dimming, I would say, uh, if needed, when the system is, is operating, but to be able to change all the design, etc., it will take some time, so um, I think it will come. Okay, thank you. And as a question, would the corona give a chance to reinvent our so-called old topics? That is to say the night is for sleeping and not for walking. Can we interrupt our social walking behavior or how to raise awareness? Um, yeah, big questions. <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, we probably need some collective conversations here. No, I, I wouldn't say I can, I can answer like uh, such questions. I think uh, only time will tell um I, of course night is for sleeping for sure uh but a lot of people are using the night so uh, we also need to take care of uh those people um so hmm. yeah a lot of yes. things we need to think about i i guess collectively all together yes and perhaps the last question, perhaps a tricky one as well. We have all the smart things in our pockets. Um, what do you think? Have we managed so far to integrate with these new technologies already other young generation, or do we need to invest more into that with innovative co-creation tools? Yeah, well, that's, that's one thing we've seen actually, even as, as the Lucy network itself, um, th there's a, a, yeah, an incredible, um, a step that's been taken, I think, from from the cities, um, you know, uh, from from many people, of course, uh, being more online and using tools that uh, they didn't think they would be able to use. In some cities, even, uh, you know, um, a lot of the the, the workers uh, even didn't have access to uh, to yeah online sharing uh, tools or to these uh, uh, platforms. Um, or to yeah collect collective collaborative documents or whatever so and and they have like moved or teleworking even teleworking in, in, in companies of course everybody has moved steps very very uh, quickly so you know there are ma major barriers of course but uh, when you have issues you can you can go very fast in upgrading and and uh, using technologies uh, okay. and of course of course those tools should be ways to 
co-create. And as, as I was saying, um, we're really missing the in-person experience. Um, and you need some prior existing uh, uh, contacts and, and uh, ways to work together. Uh, the online experience is not the answer to everything, of course. Uh, so we have to invest a lot on co-creating together. Uh, the, 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 they are only tools. Uh, so we have to work together on how we can create. And I think, uh, and it's also a little uh, awareness raising here for, for the tool that we launched also in Lucy, but in, in the Lucia project, the, the knowledge center, it's kind of our answer to uh, how do we do this together, even if we have to be online? Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic tool. So I'd once again uh, want to ask everyone to take a look. Yes, you can uh, ask your, your access through the link I post in the chat box. So please do so. And uh, speaking uh, about co-creation, perhaps the last word, uh, Mark, uh, you spoke about the white paper. Maybe you can uh, say a few words about the white paper. Yeah. So um, in, in Lucy, we, we have um, uh, an idea that uh, cities should also work together and uh, uh, be the voices, uh, having this co-creation and collaborative methods we were talking about. And um, with this fantastic other uh, interact project called SmartSpace, which Rianne will introduce in a minute, um, yeah. we, we, we managed to work together uh, with the, the four cities that are in the project, but also the wider cities in this region. Uh, and I hope also the wider uh, cities from Lucy to um, ask ourselves what are the best questions in terms of smart lighting for today. Uh, I, I mentioned this very quickly in, in my presentation. Uh, how do we find the smart lighting techniques which are added value for the society and not technology for technology's sake? Um, I mentioned briefly, of course, the dimming techniques and uh, et cetera. But as, as we will see in, in smart lighting, there's a, many, many different use cases, many different things that we can incorporate. Um, so the, 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 yeah, cities are asking a lot of questions. Um, so we thought that we'd come together and we'd find those big questions and try to, to find uh, the, the areas where answer. So it will be a kind of a, a white paper, a document that, that is um, done collaboratively um, and uh, I hope it will be a first step to yeah, uh, answer questions. The big question for us is not to do some pilot projects or to start uh, small, uh, uh, yeah, small pilot sites or do some experiments. Of course, this is still ongoing in many projects, many cities. But the big question is how do we scale up? Uh, how do we, uh, in, in, in cities, whether they be small or, or large or medium sized, um, how do we move to the next level? and? Um, yeah, so we're also kind of uh, working for the future here. OK, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. And this gives me the chance to have a perfect transition to our next speakers, um, Dr. Rian Vakatborg from Intelligent Lighting Institute, Technical University of Eindhoven, Netherlands. So Rian will speak uh, with put a light on the future and we speak about the opportunities for improving public space with smart lighting, including some lessons from the smart space project we were talking about. Thank you, Rian. You are on. Thank you very much. Uh, I can hear you perfectly. So I give you the floor. And can you also see my screen? Yes. Ah, perfect. Um, no, go back. I wasn't there yet. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in this very interesting uh, webinar with this nice title, Light on the Future. Uh, I hope to share a little bit on uh, what that future might be, and especially the, the coming years, not the far future, but the things we can already invest in. Uh, as Mark also introduced, I'm going to speak about the results from the Smart Space project. Um, and Smart Space is actually your sister project that aims to facilitate the uptake of smart lighting in smaller and medium-sized cities. And we do so, or it, it's the main aim is to enhance energy efficiency and to reduce CO2 emissions. Uh, and we do that in, in two steps, so to say. The first step is to introduce LED lighting. And of course, that will be the biggest uh, savior of energy. 
The other thing we investigate is can we do it even, can we save even more energy by using smart lighting? If we introduce smart lights, Mark also introduced lights only when it's needed, will that even lead to more energy reduction? And I'm going to show some of the results that we have uh, so far. So first let me explain a little bit on what we understand smart public lighting is. Uh, so here you see the picture and of course in the center of that there is the, the, the urban space. It's about urban space, people engaging there, people walking, shopping, driving, uh, jogging, all kinds of activities you do out there um, and that are enabled by lighting and by other new technologies. So there's all kinds of things we can measure nowadays in, in public space. So air quality, um, uh, presence and movement of people, uh, activities, emotions of people, conditions of roads, of cars. It's all that information that we get through different appliances. That will give us a lot of data, of course. We can manage that and we can send that back, <laughs> so to say, into public space through services. And then lighting is again an actuator to stimulate behavior or uh, change even behavior. So we can go to uh, energy efficiency, but also uh, realize a higher level of well being. And for that, of course, we have a lot of uh, technology that's needed. Um, so for instance, the infrastructure, we tend to say everything that's underground, but of course it can also be in the cloud. The lighting part, the new lighting part, uh, including special lighting elements, lighting controls or controls in a broad sense. So what sort of sensors, software, but also other IoT appliances do we have? Uh, and of course, data management. So those new technologies will help us to make these new services uh, available. And then coming from a technology background, uh, being at the Technical University of Eindhoven, of course, we tend to say everything is possible. And if everything is possible, then where do we start? Well, we tend to start with citizens. So I'm happy that it was also in the questions, how can we involve citizens to think along about lighting. It's not easy because talking about light, it's just there. So every time you, you try to talk to people about lighting, they, they point at the light pole and think it's ugly or nicely designed, but light itself is very intangible. So we tend to go out there and ask to people and we see them as experts of their living environment. So we don't talk about light as such, but we talk about their environment, about public space. And we start a dialogue by a simple question, say, what do you think are pleasant and unpleasant places in your area? And then people are really able to, to talk about what they do outside and what they want to do. And even, for instance, if we bring maps, this, this girl had a very good example. She said, at night I go sporting and then uh, on my way over there, I cycle this way and then I come back and I cycle this way back. And then you start asking, why? Why don't you take the same route back? The other one is longer. And I says, yeah, but there's a, there's a dark spot there. I don't like to go there. So by talking to them and taking them seriously and listen to what they do, you get their needs and their opportunities. And then we don't think it's, it's, it's rocket science. We don't hear new things. We don't reinvent Maslow. But what makes it very good is that we have more, more or less generic needs of citizens, but we, we can link them to very specific locations and situations. So for instance, if they talk about bicycle crossings, then they can really point out where they, th they don't feel safe as a cyclist, but also what can be done to improve that. From what space or from what direction don't they see things very, very well. Another thing was the comfort in adjacent houses. Lots of people that live near uh, uh, go-through uh, roads have really 
uh, an issue with the comfort in their houses. They say, I can't sleep at night. Or they say, I don't have to turn on my light. I can read a book with the lighting that comes in. Especially the introduction of LED lighting, which is far more white and bright, introduces also new problems that you can only learn from people who are living there every day. So we get a lot of information on uh, on, on these places that, that people really need to improve. And then in the second stage, we, we go to workshops where we co-create with them again use cases. So we analyze the situations with experts from the municipality, other lighting experts, but also with people and local stakeholders from the area. And we create a storyboard of interactive use. What is really happening there? Who are the target groups? What do they do there and when? And we try to come up, I have an example here. Uh, we try to come up with a scenario that goes through the whole well, night, so to say, uh, or, the, or the dark uh, times. And we tend to think of who is there at what moment and what's the lighting scene that they really need then. So in the morning, for instance, we have commuters that come out of a bus that have to cross, cross the street. At the end of the day, you'd like to be inviting to, to a shopping experience. So you want to show the, the shop windows and have a nice atmosphere so that people will stay there. During nights, there's hardly any light, but you do want the people that are out there to feel safe. So there's different lighting scenes that you can design over the course of the day and night. In the Smart Space project, we eventually came up with 33 of those desired scenarios that were designed with people from the area that gave a good answer to their needs for that area. So for different functionalities. And by studying that, we saw that there were really three clustered clusters of anticipated use. The first was improving safety for all road users. You could say that's the basic function of light. Um, the second one was how to enhance leisure experience. Leisure experience can be all kinds of things that people want to do outside, sports, shopping, cycling, meeting with friends, uh, anything <laughs> that they do in leisure time. And the third one is increasing security for nightlife. That's a need that you hear more and more that in nighttime, especially pub areas or other areas where people go at night, that you can also use lighting to increase, increase security and add new functionalities. Apart from those three clusters, we also identified different levels of interactive use. And I want to go through them uh, one by one. The first level is static lighting. And actually, that's not so intelligent at all. So the lights do not adapt to any activities uh, on the street or any other direct input. The scenes are predefined and controlled for one point. So actually, this is something that you can also do with uh, the current lighting. You don't have to do the transition to LED yet. It's just one lighting scene, for instance, for commuting. You provide a nice uh, overview of the area so that you can see where you walk and you can avoid collisions between uh, commuting uh, flows. Or you can do an enhanced shopping experience if you keep the light level very low and you also include the lights from the shop, shops and the other facades. You can create a nice atmosphere. So it's all about a nicely designed atmosphere, basically but only with one lighting scene that's activated on and off by a clock timer in the control software. So there's no data in the system and no communication uh, needed really. It's only by local switching. Then we come to the second stage that is active lighting. There, here we have multiple lighting scenes uh, that are created for specific routes, specific locations, time of the day or the season. And these scenes are also predefined and controlled for one point. So what we see here, for instance, is a bicycle crossing. This is alongside a main road. And people that were living there said, why does the road need lighting? We as cyclists have no lighting. The road has lighting and cars already bring their own lights. So why can't we turn that off? That will save energy. It will be better for nightlife. 
So why don't we switch them off and then have good lighting on the bicycle path and especially the crossings? So what we designed here in the use case is that we make uh, a dimming uh, scenario over the night, over the course of the night, but with a constant high contrast for good, brightly lighted uh, crossings and less lighting at the road. You can also create surprising experience, for instance, for the, for the nightlife. So why don't you make uh, going out a really nice, memorable event? So here we designed a, a, a walking route from the parking lane to the theater where people go, go out. And if you have well-timed objects that might light up, that can enhance the drawing in or the waving goodbye of people uh, that are going out there. So in the active layer, you have multiple static lighting scenes that are still activated on off by a clock timer in the control software. The third level of interaction is reactive lighting. Then the lights adapt for multiple lighting scenes to environmental context and characteristics, and it is based on real life or real time input. So for instance, for commuting, for providing safety for road users, what you could do is, is in many cities, we experience that the loading trucks are also uh, there at the same time when a lot of school children commute to school. So what you could do is use a sensor to detect them and to give them brighter light or to give special indicated routes uh, around them to avoid collisions. In nightlife, you can always also use many different uh, uh, lighting scenes to create pleasant atmosphere. For instance, in going from one pub to another, or also to enhance safety by making pickup points uh, for taxis uh, if you want to leave the place at the end of the evening. So in the reactive layer, we see that there are multiple static lighting scenes and the scene selection is activated by a single trigger or a sensor. It's still slow. It is real time, but you don't need instant changing. It can be a slow reaction to, for instance, uh, trucks or other things that are happening in the street. <clears throat> At the fourth level of uh, interaction, we have interactive lighting. Here the lights anticipate with local adaption of lighting on real-time input, and this has to be fast. For instance, uh, a good visibility of cyclists and pedestrians. We see this more and more appearing in, in cities, of course, that the lighting is dimmed to a very low level or even out. Um, and when uh, a cyclist or a pedestrian is, uh, is uh, detected, then the light goes off, on and goes and dims further down. So then you really need uh, uh, live tracking and an instant reaction to things that are happening there. You can also use uh, this to create a really fun and lively area to evoke people to go out and to enjoy that area, to be active, to walk and to play, for instance. So here we designed a lighting scene where the light colors and the atmosphere adapt to the sunset. So you will attract people to go out and watch the sunset and experience it in, in a way richer uh, experience than that they would have if you were only looking at the sun, sun itself. And you can also introduce playful elements. So for instance, stepping stones that really are playful for people to interact with. In these scenarios, you can also support guards, for instance, in, uh, in the nightlife areas to with technology that can detect and locate incidents. And then you can either de-escalate the aggressive behavior by lighting out the, the, the special scene where it happens, or you can uh, um, alarm the, the guards and they can send someone to see what's happening to see if they can de-escalate the aggressive behavior. So in the interactive layer, we have dynamic scenes with a localized effect, and the scene selection is activated by multiple triggers or by the use of people that are there. Then you also have to monitor the data from the sensors and the scene, and the communication is bi-directional and fast. 
in the fifth and last uh, interaction level, we have intelligent lighting. Here the lights adapt also to a personalized effect, but it makes decisions based on self-learning systems. So actually here the, the system learns itself and uh, will, will provide a lighting scene that is based on uh, historical data uh, that it has from earlier events or from other sources. So for instance, for to increase safety and comfort for users, you can learn from historical data that are use patterns, but also accidents and near accidents. And the system can adapt the settings according on what it knows and on, uh, on real-time input, for instance, weather conditions. You can enhance leisure experience also with personalized shopping routes or training routes. So if I put my data in there and it knows what I like to shop, then I can get a nice shopping route through the city, which might differ from someone else with other personal uh, uh, preferences. But you can also do that for training, for instance, the interval training. Uh, so you can, you can run with your light and maybe even have your own light show at the end if you, if you are better at it than you were yesterday. Also for avoiding accidents, you can adapt scenes to the atmosphere and the emotions that you measure, for instance, in a pub street. And there you can also increase the security by avoiding accidents and not only indicating them. All based on historical data and self-creating lighting scenes with a personalized effect. So this is what we found, five different interaction levels in smart lighting. And why is this important? You could say, why bother? There's, there's differences in the interaction, yes, but why do we want to know that? So I'll take you back again to this picture, because here we also saw what the components were of smart lighting. And what if we put that next to those interactive levels? So there are differences in what you need for, for instance, the lighting, the controls, the data management, and the infrastructure. So don't be scared for the next picture. I'm not going to explain it in too much detail. But what you see is that each level of interaction has different requirements for what you need in the system. So for instance, if you go to intelligent and interactive lighting, you need high speed bidirectional communication, which you do not really need for the first three levels of interaction. So what we want to say with this picture is that you, if you design your city, look at the functionality that you need in a specific area, and then you can, you, you also will know what you will need uh, for components in your smart lighting system. So the learnings from smart space so far is that we think there's a lot of opportunities for smart lighting to design scenes where you will only uh, put light out there when it's needed, but also in a way that people will enjoy it and, and uh, make better use of urban space. These lighting systems will be there and they will become smarter and smarter in the, in the near future. So for cities, it's really important that you understand what this will mean for your public space. As I said, look at the different functional um, functional requirements of spaces, because some of the things you will do in your city center, but maybe not in neighborhoods, but by rethinking what it is you really want and what the level of interactive use will be, you can also define the different lighting solutions and you might make different choices in the investments that you make in different areas. So we hope that this framework will help to make future-proof decisions for your investment in smart lighting systems. And the next step we are doing in the project is that we are only also designing a uh, technological roadmap where we, will, where we are now investigated what are already the components that are available, but also the development, what will be available in the coming years, so that you can better design uh, the lighting systems that you want as a city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rian.
for sharing uh, these results with us. Uh, I think that Ike has many remarks and questions. Perhaps it would be better if you take the floor and uh, ask them to Rian yourself. And I must say that I find very, very interesting the typology of light interaction for smart lighting you came up with. Um, as we have seen, smart space projects have many similarities with the Lucia projects. And it's uh, very interesting to make links between these two projects and to exchange experience and learn about the outcomes of one to another one. So thank you for sharing these insights. Ike, I, do, do you want to take the floor or should I read your question and comments? Ah. Yes. I think, no, you are mute. No. <laughs> okay, I think you will need to refresh. So, so I will read your comments. Uh, Ike was uh, just saying that she's so happy to see that you don't concentrate on rocket science. So she thanks you for the wonderful example of Liberty Square. And uh, as uh, we are used to this young very much, but during daylight. Mm -hmm. And she encouraged you to apply, to apply sorry, for a presentation for Velo City 2021 um, about uh, so the, the, sorry, the light for cyclists. She has a question, how to bring that issue deeper into all levels? We know, we know that cycling and walking contribute to the 11 and uh, 17 SDGs and that not only, do, only during daytime time, sorry. So how to bring that issue deeper into all levels? Um, that's a very good question. I think that that <laughs> might also be a new project that we will start. Um, I, what, what we, one of the first things that we already encounter by working with these small and medium sized cities is that it takes a while before we have the awareness that light can be used as an actuator. So mm -hmm. until now, light was a static thing. It was on <laughs> and during the day it was off. What you can do with these scenarios is not only adapt to better on and off, but also use it as an actuator to stimulate things and to make people aware of things happening in public space. So I think that's, that's one of the first questions that we need to do. Uh, and that can be done through these levels. And then we can also encounter other issues where we can use this actuator uh, in, in, in a better way. Also coming back to, uh, to Tony's first presentation where you also include, for instance, mobility. There's already a lot done in, in uh, um, mobility um, technology. We, we know, of course, the lights that are there, but if you can combine that with, uh, with street lighting, we have some projects also at the, the university uh, on testing that. If you can use the, the, the normal street lighting in combination with your traffic lighting, of course, you can also nudge people into certain behavior. So those are all very interesting things. And we are, I think, only on, 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 on well, at the beginning of it, we can we can mm -hmm. still make big steps there, but we need to make small steps because we are talking about public space. So we are not really allowed to make many mistakes, especially not in uh, in traffic. Yes. And I, I hope that sort of answered your question. Uh, I'm not sure, Heike. I think so. I think Heike will uh, write into the chat. The last question. Do, do we need more different data from citizens via smartphone tracking, like we do with cyclists, to increase safety? Or do you think we already have enough data to increase public quality? Um, that's that's one of the main questions that we are uh, discussing also in the Smart Space Project. On each level, you need different types of data. Um, and of course, that's also a sensitive topic to talk about in public space. Because if you gather data in public space, people still need to be safe to be there without being noticed. Uh, so we are also looking at solutions that are uh, uh, where you have privacy by design, cameras that will not take all the data but only the data that you need for that solution. And I think also there we are only on, uh, on the first steps of, of what we need. Of course, you can use uh, smartphone data. Uh, we, we, we all have that data in our hand. But what if I'm not willing to share my data? 
uh, then, and, and we design a system that's actuated by the presence of smartphones, then don't I get any light because I'm not willing to share my data? Uh, so those are still big issues and ethical issues that we need to discuss. I mean, we, we also see that sometimes there are solutions where the people that don't have much money to do it differently have to share all their data to be able to get the same services. So that, that cannot really be the issue. So we are really looking into how can you make it open, but also democratic uh, so that people can still have an option of sharing data that they want, but keeping other data that they want for themselves privately, but have a system that still works under any conditions. Mm -hmm. Yes, such a big question for the future. Very big question. Yes. yes. Thank you very much, Rianne, for your presentation today. You're welcome. Um, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce the next speaker, um, Yannicka Wicklander. Uh, who is a lighting designer, so a new perspective, and um, she's trained as an architect and is a CEO of Okidoki Architects in Sweden. And Yannicka will speak about light in the post-pandemic landscape. Thank you, Yannicka. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want I can to... hear you. You can hear me, and I'm also going to share yes. my presentation. Perhaps a, a bit low, if you can speak a bit louder. Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to share my presentation okay I, I do have some trouble to hear you perhaps and i can't see you yes i can see your presentation now thank you i might need to have the camera off in order to okay but I, I do have some trouble to hear you Yannick. yes how yes. is this is it better now now it's much yes. better. Thank you, Yannick. Mm -hmm. So I have turned off my camera in order to, for the uh, audio to become better. And, okay, uh, perfect. I, I will now, now you will not be seeing me presenting, you will be seeing my presentation. So um, I will start off now. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be invited to lecture in this context. Um, and uh, as mentioned, uh, my name is Janneke Wicklander. I'm an architect, a landscape architect and a lighting designer. And uh, my chosen part of the profession uh, derives actually from uh, my early conversations with my grandfather who worked in the field of neuroscience. And growing up, uh, he talked a lot to me about how mankind and our ancient brain actually interprets uh, environments and how we work with this kind of data and how that sort of makes us react in different ways or makes our brain to work in different kinds of ways. And what I brought with me from that part of my life is actually to, in all of the designs that I do, whether it's architecture, urban planning, landscape, or lighting design, they always coincide. And it is always of great importance to define the why as much as the what in order for the how to be relevant. So, as mentioned by earlier speakers, uh, the perspectives has changed. For the last eight months, new perspectives have been given to us. Life has been altered. How we used to do things is changing. Scale, speed, mobility, technology, everything has changed. And very much so more rapidly for the last eight months due to the pandemic. But what permanence remains and innovations will we see? in the light of the pandemic. Those innovations are, of course, yet to be discovered. Reflecting the other week with one of the engineers in the office, um, reflecting on the pandemic and on resilience, she said, who would, who would have believed me, Janneke, if I would have said that in October 2020, Times Square would be one of our least energy efficient public spaces? Also, um, other perspectives that changed was, of course, the office. Being fortunate as a suite with a bit of a different approach to regulations, spring provided outdoor daylight, foresting and recreation as my new office uh, during the pandemic. 
This helped me and other Swedes to endless hours of digital meetings and changed perspectives. This was also a part of the Swedish healthcare administration for Swedes to cope with the pandemic aspects. And as much as I love the escapism that somewhat rested my brain, aspects of the pandemic were visible even in my fabulous new context. Please keep two meters of distance. So now we're moving into a new season and winter is coming. Last week, uh, my team was extra happy because we won a competition for a lighting design a master plan for the city of Malmö. We were extra happy because we knew that this will help both the public health of the city of Malmö and it will also help it struggle to survive the old economic model of constant growth of GDP in a post-pandemic landscape. The competition entry was also named after a quote, quote from a Swedish poet taken from his publication called Chaos. Chaos was for us a suitable term for reflecting on 2020 and the quote itself, it's only as beautiful as when the sun set, emphasized cultural and biological aspects of light that we find of importance. So the combination of all of these different aspects are a combination that answers the question why, it gives us the what, and it gives us a relevant and strong how. Light as part of my DNA then. Facing a period in Sweden of the sun rising at 10 a.m. and setting at 15 p.m. in the back of my mind, constantly luring, is public health and recreation in the retrospective of the pandemic. Strengthened by the fact, uh, embedded in my DNA, is the light culture that formed me and, and some of, of, our others, uh, of, of other suites. A solid why and high, how to design light for human interaction and well-being affecting all aspects of our everyday life. The strictly limited outdoor usage that this season brings needs clever design to take care of all of us. The extreme and our heritage. In the north of the Nordic countries, uh, we have a special condition called Arctic light, which basically means that the sun never sets in the summer and it never rises a lot in long winter months. This way of living you can also see is mirrored in, in the culture of the far Nordic countries. We have numerous public holidays uh, shared by various religions. Uh, it's shown in hedonism as well as in Christianity. <laughs> the celebration of light is always, always present through the year. Interpretations. Light cultures, perceptions of qualities of light. These light conditions affect also our perception and culture related to light. For example, the world glare, strangely enough, is slightly positive uh, in, in the northern parts of Sweden, more than perhaps in Central Europe. Since in the northern parts of Sweden, glare is related to daylight because it means that it's sunny and warm. You, you say light, I think shadow is sorry uh, the bigger picture being able to sorry being able to read the space its boundaries and orient via landmarks is crucial for a thousand year old brain this biological aspect of feeling safe has not changed despite technology's evolution the internet and smart gadgets our ancient brain designed to fight or flee in order to survive will overrun all of our systems if we don't take it, this into account in our designs. Now well, my presentation seems to be stuck. So. You say light and I think shadow. How we read and interpret shadows is also essential to us in how to understand space. Uh, this light of plaza also resembles our memories of that day in the forest that soothes and eases our minds that might be quite stressed in everyday life and also in the pandemic context. The warmth underneath the bench resembles the, the hurt, the fire, which one we gathered around and gave us warmth eh, back in the days. So due to extreme environments of light, we understand how cultural aspects of light in all scope of work helps us to create the understanding, the why uh, of 
what a design needs to look like. So light as a medium. This park that we see in this picture, it's not at all a badly lit up environment, but reflecting on this park and then the slide before, we grasp the possibilities of light as a medium to help mankind and our very old brain to cope during times of darkness, uh, where we, before industrialism, biologically are programmed to sleep. So the human factor. So far, we have seen how different context and climate can influence the way we relate to light. But what are the physical and physiological aspects? And how does human factor play a part in the light of a pandemic? Let's have a look. Everything we see is evoked by light, Louis Kahn quoted, the architect very interested in light. Human evolved over millions of years on a continent where day and night length was fairly equal, and where blue sky in the morning naturally signaled waking, and while red sky at night meant sleep. In the 19th century, this adherence to the solar 24 hours light and dark cycle was severely disrupted by the requirements of the industrial society. As the world industrialized, mankind, of course, developed the frontal lobe thinking, and we can today logically reason around fears if given the right context. Circadian rhythm. But as we know, amygdala, the little part in the back of our brain, still shortcuts our strategic things, thinking a thousand times per day. It's every time you feel stressed or scared. And as mankind extended the working day, which coincided with the availability of electrical light, we also started to push biology. So why and when is daylight crucial? Well, most of us that listen to this seminar maybe know this, but as for in general, uh, given the Nobel Prize as late as in 2017, circadian rhythm describes the body's physical, physiological, and psychological changes over a 24 hour period. This is embedded in our genes. However, until recently, science didn't know what governed these rhythms. We now understand how and why the key is light, particularly daylight. It's a non visual pathway from the eyes to the brain that totally separate, is totally separated from vision. Indeed, even a blind person has circadian rhythm. Information about light levels is sent to an organ that is like a master pacemaker, coordinating all the cellular clocks in the body. It regulates particularly melatonin, the sleep hormone, the growth hormone, and cortisol, that is for alertness. A robust 24-hour pattern of light and dark is vital to maintaining our body health and well-being. And this aspect is extremely interesting in relation to pandemics and lockdown, as well as the uh, light aspect. So remember my extended office from the spring, me walking, having digital meetings in a lovely daylit park. This is another aspect. Uh, and this, of course, is from a workspace inside a mine. But in the winter months, in, in in this part of the world, uh, we come to work in the dark, we go home in the dark, we pick up our kids in the dark, and we work all day in electrical lit environments. Without experience, bright daylight or body, our body clocks will never be reset. And this, of course, has effects. The wrong type of light also at the wrong time can affect our body clocks and causing other illnesses. Circadian rhythm is a relevant factor in chronic maladies such as diabetes, hypertension, anxiety, and depression. Um, and these are, of course, visual and non-visual aspects of lighting design. So who can actually help? We can consider visual and non-visual aspects when helping improving our designs. Together, we can take informed decisions and responsibility to plan and design and implement well-lit environments, answering the why with the great what and how. Why is this of importance then? 
well in the pandemic context where mankind is already extremely stressed it's of course of great importance to prolong these kind of activities in order to stay healthy and before the pandemic accounted for was 13.8 million days lost and 40 percent of all reported illnesses could relate to these kind of problems Recent studies demonstrate how light increases the length and the quality of sleep and has a direct impact on our causal brain activity. So, under what light do we see the world? Let's go to work, guys. Variations. Please try and focus on these light conditions now. Feel the light. And then another kind of old and familiar. Good morning, dear colleagues. Don't you really feel happy and exaggerated to go to work? As creatures of habits, this is what we have accustomed to. And this is what many people around the world are exposed to every day at work or at home. Maybe this is a bit exaggerated, but it's not so far from the truth. So it's actually about coming going back to the future different light setting lets us see different parts of this forest call for different actions at the daylight and the lights interaction with the space is constantly changing what light directs intensity or diffusion enhances the shadow and depth and how does the color change not only because there's a change of season studies show that a well taken care of light environment makes people have much better sense of health and inspire people to exercise more. This is important, even more important for children, adolescents and elderly, and of course, of great importance in the pandemic. So this rather static, poor lit environment. Let's take a moment to think about not only indoors, but outdoors, how often this light situation can be fined and how it ref reflects on the balance between quality and quantity. So the topic is, of course, on the future. That's where we find the strength to move forward. And this is one of mankind's greatest strengths, looking into the future, adapting and moving forward. So what will one use lighting for in the future? And why would you invest in using a lighting design? So we see uh, that in all ev evolution of mankind, uh, light moves into a new era and the personal space, a tech driven development is also part of mankind's evolution. Light will move from the sim single object itself we have seen in many of the previous presentations, pre presenters' presentations as well, and move into this more personalized space. And we need to take this into consideration. As we digitalize, light also becomes of greater importance uh, to communication. This is the halo by Nan Sayo at MIT, and this is wearable light for communication. Uh, uh, you can use an app and different kind of light scenarios are set, angry, sad or different in order to be able to interact in a nice way in our new medium, the camera. Anonymous is another project by Jing Kai Liu from the Outreach School of Arts in Netherlands. Jing created this projection that is a distortion that makes it impossible for face recognition cameras in city planning <laughs> to, to read your features. Also, what we see today is light as part of a revolution in Belarus. The oppressed people of Belarus used infrared cameras to film their oppressors who were wearing masks in order to identify their features. Also, uh, Chuan Zhao and Timothy Liu at MIT uh, has developed a kind of ink tattoo uh, that responds to certain 
chemicals in your body and sort of alerts uh, what kind of um, viruses or uh, chemicals are in your body. Imagine this as a C19 detector, good or bad. We, of course, also see uh, the different kinds of uh, more distancing signaling, and they're, of course, used for safety, but could also be used in the pandemic landscape in different kinds of ways. Or if you just want to feel fancy on a Friday, you can also choose and buy whatever projection you can find at Neklumi uh, in order to shine the the most brightly bright, the brightest at whatever party you would attend on distance where the protection is placed is of course uh, uh, a secret of the company so we're going to have to ask them later and then we have sandra sandra ray um, based in paris with her startup glowy sandra works with uh, biologists bioluminescent bacteria where she tries to light up the city with uh, uh, nature's own bacteria. And then, of course, also we have the light emitting wallpaper, the OLED, the C light, the E light, and the LG that sort of changed light from a medium to a bit of a material when it emerged the market. Also, now uh, we have cellulosa film that is not in need of installation, but with an upcoming collaboration of a company and the University of Luleå in Sweden, which will be very interesting to look at in the future. And then last but not least, uh, we have a competition entry from Daria Nikoleva from Clue 2018. And uh, the entry is called Phil or Feel. And uh, the competition entry is described like this. Do you feel, do you know the feeling when you're waiting for somebody on the street or in the square and your phone is ready to die? And after a while, you're just standing alone in the crowd without a phone service, having no idea how to find your person that you're waiting for. When you are staying on the bus station after work, late in the evening and feeling just loneliness and fatigue. Phil will help you to get warm, make your way safe and change your phone. It focuses on sight and touch. So Phil is somewhat uh, about an AI. It's a personalized space and it's interactive with your brain and your feelings and the feeling of making you feel safe. And this was all that I had right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yannicka. Maybe you can stop sharing your screen and uh, turn on your camera. So thank you for providing us today with an uh, architect and a landscape design perspective on the future of light. Uh, I'm personally very curious about the light technology you presented at the end, uh, which may influence uh, public spaces and the individuals in the future. I really like the feel last uh, project you presented. It was also very interesting to know more about far north lights and urban lighting, and also about the cultural perception of lights. Uh, speaking of which, we have a question from Rian. Um, she said, interesting, the cultural factor you bring into your examples, the appreciation of light, colors, luminance, shadows, differ very much in different parts of Europe and of the world. Do you investigate that in your practice? Yes, we try to, of course, wherever we practice, we need to understand the light culture in which context we, we create the design and the how, of course. And I think that in terms of solving the world's problem or in terms of talking about technological systems, maybe at times we get lost. And that is why I think that the why is also so important when creating the how and that the cultural context always needs to be applied. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I would have many more questions, but we are running out of time. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. And uh, thank you for, uh, to every speaker who are here today with us. And uh, for the final words, I would like to give the floor to Eike. Uh, I do up. Yes, your sound yes. works now. So, yes, I sorry. So. Just Can you hear me? Left. 
Yes, definitely. So well, this, thank you, Kami. Um, that I would say was a very overwhelming session today, full with social dimension of light. Um, and I must admit um, that was so interesting. I do have tons of more questions here on paper. Um, I'm not going to ask you now. I invite you to um, our um, other sessions we have in the uh, side events and to look at our videos and all we uh, provide into Lucia. But um, before closing this very last webinar today, let's have a look back. Lucia presented a huge overview uh, with several webinars and I think today it was really a wonderful webinar with wonderful presenters. Um, the dimension or the social dimension of light in combination with future smart cities and the point Mark mentioned with resilient cities is quite important, not only for Lucia, but worldwide. Um, the webinars altogether have shown that we have enormous problems uh, and challenges to solve in the future, like light pollution is just one aspect. And the other aspect is really that we need to care about people. And this point came out today on a very deep level. Um, Rihanna, thank you very much for showing us your wonderful signs, very structured and very clear. And thank you, Janika, for these deep insights and that you gave us really a feel for light. Um, so Mark gave an overall very good umbrella today at the beginning. Thank you for the cooperation with Lucy. And I hope that we also can learn in Lucia, but also contribute uh, to more exchange with all of you. And um, I know we have some time to go for more progress in our project. But nevertheless, uh, we are very keen um, to exchange our ideas, to exchange important um, aspects of future lighting, especially for the city. Um, so again, please go and look at our uh, web pages. Please uh, find out more on the Lucia Knowledge Center. And of course, we are looking forward to the white paper, which comes uh, in uh, summer 21. Thank you so much for participating today. Thank you for the warm welcome from the city of Gothenburg. And thank you to Camille to guide us today through this session. And of course, again, to Nicholas, who did the tech technology side of this uh, webinar today. Thank you so much and take care. Thanks. Thank you very much, Aike. And yeah, thank you to everyone for being here today and special thanks to the city of uh, Gothenburg, the city of Hamburg, and uh, all the partners of the Lucia project and uh, Nicolas, Tommy, everyone. And please have time to visit our booth and the Lucia webpage. Take care and thank you very much to her. Bye.